Okay, I think we are being live streamed to Facebook. So we'll just give it a second or two just to make sure that it's kind of plugged in and everything's working in sync as it should be. So I think let's get going. We're dead on the hour. Um, hello, everybody. It's glad I'm glad to be back here again. And this evening, I've got the fantastic Julie Daniels with me. Uh, now, those who don't know Julie, she is Professor of Regenerative Medicine and Cellular Therapy at University College London, uh, except until next week, where she retires and puts her full efforts into her dog training business, because that's the other side of this wonderful person. Um, I first met Julie several years ago now when she went through our COPE diploma levels four and five. And she went on from there, graduating with flying colours to go and do a master's degree um, in clinical animal behaviour at University of Edinburgh. And for that, for her dissertation, she actually won the prize for it at the University of Edinburgh. From that dissertation, we have two published papers in the Journal of Veterinary Behaviour, um, which you, I hope you, you've read and, and digested. And both those papers have actually been given sort of star ratings by um, Professor Karen Overall, who is editor in chief of that particular journal. So that is a real accolade. And basically that accolade is given because of the quality of the papers and their practical use uh, within the dog training world. Um, she has many other publications under her name. She's a member of all sorts of organizations, um, a skill set to, to but sort of working its way all the way outside the door. So I think without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Julie. And Julie, welcome. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Robert. And thank you, Andy. I really appreciate being able to join you all this evening. I've just heard my greyhound start crying downstairs. So hopefully that will stop very soon. <laughs> it's like he knows that I'm doing something important. Um, so yes, yeah, so I guess this evening is just an opportunity to, to talk to you all a little bit about the research that I've been doing. I didn't set out to do this research actually as part of my MSc. I wanted to do something practical, hands-on with dogs, but we were in the pandemic. So the only real opportunity was to do some qualitative research in the form of a, a questionnaire. So I was particularly interested in research that I could do that could help us as a community in terms of professionals working with caregivers and their animals but I really wanted to understand the client's point of view. So there may be, um, you know, dog caregivers listening as well who aren't working in, in the field. Um, and I was really keen to understand what they think of us as an industry, what they think of us as professionals, the services that we provide and, and who's doing it. And, you know, who's, who's doing what was my first um, big question. So would you like me to leave with that, Robert, or have you got something you want to chip in? No, no, I'm very good with that. I think I think the your your papers are kind of split um, across the middle, aren't they? There's first the yeah. survey of the, of the dog community or the dog yeah. behaviour community uh, to begin with, and then you then you flip the coin over and look at it from the other side of the coin. So I think it's yeah. kind of beautifully broken down into those two parts: the behaviour industry on the one side, and what the clients kind of think of us and how they um, accept or or take on board what we actually tell them. Yeah, so because we are still an unregulated industry, you know, any anybody can can turn up and profess to help you with your to help you with your animal. That that's the reality of it. But it is a serious issue because there are over forty thousand dogs. It's thought per year that are relinquished to shelter or euthanized because of behavioural problems and the potential for a good behaviour therapy programme with the right type of person, I think has got the opportunity to help a lot of these dogs avoid that really difficult situation because it's not only bad for their welfare, but it's really hard for people who are having to give up um, their animals. So, so first of all, I said I was just keen to know who's doing what. So we put together a survey and it was shared on Facebook. And thanks very much to anyone who's listening that filled it in or shared it for me, because I know a lot of people did and it made a massive difference. So we got over 230 people responding to it. There are limitations with doing surveys, of course, and we can talk about that if, if, if you're interested. But my first question really was just to find out who's offering behaviour modification. And so because it was a survey, 
we had to define what a dog trainer is and what a behaviorist is, which automatically makes it controversial because, you know, it, depending on your view will depend on where you sit on that spectrum. But just for the purposes of the, um, of just the purposes of the study, we went with, I mean, we tried to make it as simple as possible. And we described a dog trainer as being someone that would typically offer classes or one-to-one -one training to teach behaviors that people would like their dogs to be able to do, things like loose leaf walking, recall, that kind of stuff. Whereas we classified a behaviorist as somebody that um, a client would go to if they were having problems with the way that their dog was behaving. So unwanted behaviors, which could be you know, any number of things as perceived by the client. And interestingly, um, we found that most people who answered the survey actually went to, to a dog trainer as opposed to a behaviorist. We don't know why that is because we didn't ask. A lot of the questions that we that we did ask were either multiple choice or later on we had questions where we asked people, do you strongly agree, strongly disagree and everything in between to various statements. Um, and also to be able to find out not only which professional, canine professionals as we call them, were offering um, behaviour modification. I was also interested to know what types of methods that they were using. And again, for the purposes of it being easy for people to fill it in, we had to give a definition. And again, people might argue about what that, what that, those definitions should be. But I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. And we did spend a long time going through this actually with myself and um, Debbie Bosby and Sarah Brown, who were my fantastic supervisors. And we defined reward-based training as being that method where you're rewarding the behaviors that you want, whereas correction-based training is punishing behaviors that you don't want. And then we referred to balance training as being um, a mix of those two things. So I guess it's like philosophically, where are you coming from? Are you predominantly, are you doing your best to uh, use rewards in your training? Or are you happy that, no, I just need to punish the dog. It needs to understand what I'm doing. Or do you use a mixture of both? And that, that's how we defined it in very simple terms. Um, dogs that had any medical issues were excluded from the survey. Dogs that were on medication were excluded from the survey because it has been shown that can influence how people perceive the training has gone or whether they actually participate in the training at all or whether they just decide let's just let the meds do, do what they do and you know it doesn't really um I don't really have to do that much and so the survey went out on Facebook over a period of about three four months and um most people's answers were included we had a few that uh, were not in the UK and that was one of our exclusion criteria um, but essentially we collected a lot of data a lot of responses we put the data through various statistical tests. Statistics is not my strong point, never has been, despite my career in science, it's always been like, oh my goodness. So you might be relieved to hear, we're not gonna talk about the statistics unless anybody specifically wants to, to know about that. But trust me, they have all been checked, double checked um, to make sure that what we were presenting um, was correct. And of course it's now all been peer reviewed as well because it's published. So, um, so the first part of the study, as Robert mentioned, is in the, the first paper, and we were fortunate we were able to um, publish them both open access, which means that anyone can read the whole thing, should you wish to, or you can at least read the abstract if, you, if, if you'd like. And the people that responded to the survey were predominantly female, we don't know why, um, but the canine professionals um, had a more of a mixed um, gender balance in terms of who the clients went to. But the majority of people, as I said earlier, contacted a dog trainer uh, rather than a behaviorist for the problems that they were having with their, with their dog. Um, which, you know, it's, um, there could be all sorts of different reasons for that. And we, we didn't ask. But one question that we did ask that we were interested to know is what types of behaviors people were seeking help for and the top three behaviours were related to aggression towards other dogs or people or other animals, obedience, 
or fearfulness. They were so there was a variety of things that came through, but they were they were the top three. And in most cases, there were between one and three different behaviours that people wanted help with. One of them had eight different behaviours. Um, if you work in the field, you probably think, oh, gosh, yes, we've all, had one. we've all had one like that. And yeah, it can be quite challenging. And in terms of those different behaviours that were presented, we found some interesting um, correlations. So if a dog was showing aggressive behaviours towards humans, then they quite often also showed aggressive behaviours towards other animals. And when I say aggressive behaviours, again, this is defined by the client. So it might be growling, snapping, barking, um, biting, snarling in a way that's definitely not play. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> in a way that would intimidate the recipient of that behaviour, if, if you know what I mean. Um, separation and fearfulness also came up as a significant correlation, which is also already known in the literature. Um, fearfulness and sensitivity to noises. Many of us have already come across that before as well in our practice. It's also known in literature. Um, an interesting one that came out, which would be it, which would be great for someone to pursue uh, if they wanted to, is actually a, a correlation between the lack of obedience and sensitivity to noises. And it could be that, um, you know, if a dog is sensitive to a noise and they're a little bit worried that, of course, they can't necessarily learn because their brain is worried about something else to do with their own personal safety and survival, which is then being interpreted perhaps by the client as being the dog's been disobedient when actually they're just not able to concentrate and they're not able to focus because mm -hmm. um, of these competing um, emotions going on. I think you pointed out in the paper that, that the, the interest there is basically these two have never <laughs> actually been studied. No, they've not, no, I was really surprised when this There's came correlation out. with everything no. else, but not, not those two. And it seems blindingly obvious when you say it, but that nobody's actually looked at it, uh, you know, from, a, from an objective point of view, I think is really interesting. Yeah, so I think that's a, a nice little project there for someone to do if they, if they, uh, if they so wish. Uh, maybe then we might have some anecdotal comments on that yeah. as well. Um, in terms of um, those different behaviours, there was um, no significant difference in the likelihood that a client would go to a trainer versus a behaviour, regardless of what the different unwanted behaviours were. Um, and yeah, so it was it, there was no yeah, it wasn't like a particular type of behaviour meant that people went to one professional rather than another. So that was quite that was quite interesting, too. And then. We were very keen to understand from the client's point of view whether they thought the type of professional that they had consulted um, was better at helping them to get their dog's behaviour to improve over, over a different type of, of behaviour. So basically, are trainers or behaviourists better at improving a dog's behaviour? And there's a whole load of questions that go into that, and it's a very, very simplistic approach. But in our survey, in our cohort, we didn't find any difference between the capabilities of the behaviourists and the dog trainers to bring about a positive change in the dog's behaviours of the people that we surveyed, which I think is actually really encouraging that there are lots of people out there doing a good job. It is. It's labels. Labels really don't mean a lot from the client's point of view, which I think is really interesting. No, no, no. Clients we don't. All, we all clients argue over what we call ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, clients want something that's going to, to work, but not just something that's going, going to work regardless. I mean, we'll, we'll come on to that a little mm. bit um, later. And um, yeah, so in terms of um, who they go to, there was no difference between them and there was no difference in the perceived behaviour improvement between uh, what trainers could do and what um, behaviourists could do. Where we did see a difference, and this um, is not a general statement, this is a difference that was perceived, that was, that was identified, sorry, in this cohort. So you have to remember that when you do research, and yes, we got, you know, 235 eligible responses, that is a tiny, tiny number mm -hmm. compared to the number of, um, you know, pet dog caregivers that are out there. A tiny, tiny number of people actually expressing their opinion. So we have to caveat all of the data 
with that and we have to be very careful not to generalize but in this study we found that from the client's understanding of who their canine professional was in terms of what they described themselves as being and the training methods they used we found that the behaviorists were more likely to use reward-based training so looking for the behaviors that you want and, and reinforcing those whereas the trainers in this study were more likely to use balanced training approach and that came out as a statistically significant difference which was quite interesting we also had a few people that had gone to a vet um, but we didn't have enough to do statistics so we just left we had to leave those um date there's only like four people i think went to a vet for for any kind of help yeah that's fairly typical numbers there just aren't that many of them that's the trouble and they're very difficult to get hold of yeah yeah exactly exactly but and just then, just sorry. just before you go on julie very very quickly so i don't forget it um you i i'm, I'm going to defend your previous statement that you said that your numbers are very very small because you also did point out that the there's another large study the 13,700 finnish pet dogs um where your data actually correlated quite well this is this this is the one by salomon and mm -hmm. um hannes lohi over in finland so um, anyone who's listening, it's well worth getting that paper as a kind of comparison because there's a lot of useful information in there as well. Yes, thanks, Robert. Thanks for, for uh, pointing that out. That's great. Um, so, so OK, so so no difference from the client's perspective in terms of whether a trainer or a behaviorist is going to be able to affect positive change in their dog's behavior. And then interestingly, we also asked um, you know, how effective do you think the methods were that were used? And again, when we compared reward based training versus balanced training, there was no significant difference in this study between the effectiveness of those different approaches in changing the behavior in, an, in, a, in a positive way from the client's point of view, as in the behavior they didn't want was decreasing. So, um, that's something that we might want to like unpack a little bit because from my perspective going through this data it's like okay well and I am still going to say it's a, a small study because it because it is but if this data could be generalized in in broader studies and we can say that actually reward-based training and balanced training can get the same outcomes in our pet dogs then really you're coming down to an ethical question and what is it that you're comfortable to do or have someone do tell you to do to your dog and that that is another um that's another area that's very interesting for discussion and it's actually a piece of research that would be really useful um, and interesting to find out is essentially like you know do the means justify the ends from a client's perspective um because certainly in the training and behavior community there are so many arguments that are going on about what you should and shouldn't do with with a pet dog and to try to change its behavior but we don't really ever ask the people who are paying for that advice exactly well what, what do you think because some people might think well yeah okay i don't like this particular method but actually i'd rather just get on with it and get through it and my dog will change in some way versus no i definitely don't want to do that and that came out in some of the answers to the um the survey um later on and uh, Robert and I, uh, Robert reminded me before we were chatting um, a little while ago about um, a case that I had. It was going back a few years ago now. Really nice guy. He was ex-military and he had uh, he had two prosthetics from from the knee down. And he invited me to go around to help him with his Labrador. He was having issues with barking, lunging at other dogs. He explained to me what his um, requirements were, what kind of surfaces he was comfortable to walk on, what his challenges were, and, and all of that kind of thing. So that, that's why I'm telling you about his prosthetics, because it was relevant to the um, to the case. And so I spent a couple of hours at his house, explained the way that I work, demonstrated it, went through it all. And he was doing it with his dog. His mom was there as well. And she was like, yeah, yeah, this, this is great. We, we can do it. And I thought, oh, super. And you know, we've made some real progress here. And then a few days later, he contacted me and he said, thanks very much for coming round. I understand what you were telling me, but it's just not for me. And I was like, 
what do you mean it's it's I was thinking like crack it what, what have I done what have I what have I not done and essentially what I think he meant was the type my type of training approach wasn't what he was either expecting or and or thought that his dog needed even though his dog was responding to the you know the sort of foundation training that we were doing in his house and I was saying like when we meet we'll go outside and we'll be you know x many meters away from another dog so that your dog can be successful and, and all of that kind of thing and he just said like he was very very polite which was nice um but he just basically said you know your training your training isn't for me so I'm going to go elsewhere and I was absolutely gutted I felt such a failure and felt like I felt like I've really I've let the dog down I've let him down I've let myself down and then as sort of time went past I began to realize that actually you know we can't we can't always reach everybody and yes he probably went somewhere else and they may have used more I don't know they may have used more harsh techniques or 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 something like that but you know I did my best to try to persuade him and I think the fact that he was polite I think he recognized that he could have just been like really awful and demanded his money back we didn't do anything like that so um so that's just a little um it's just a little aside, but I think sometimes that because we're so passionate about what we do and wanting to get our message across, it's like it's OK if if it if you can't always achieve that. I think as long as we try our best, but there will be just some people who choose a different path. And, you know, unfortunately for their animals, that that's their path, isn't it? That's their. their <clears throat> and I think I think your your second paper kind of really, really nails that message, doesn't it? Uh, mm. That where you actually look at it from the from the client's point of view. Yeah. So so from that perspective, so the, the, the sort of questions that followed on from that, I was really keen to understand um, in the, the way that the canine professional, whether it's a trainer or a behaviorist, interacts with the client. Does that then have any influence on whether they are likely or not to follow the behavior modification plan that is offered to them because there are so many different things that pull on people's time and, and all of that but if you think about it that initial behavioral consultation it's like that's where you make your first impressions that's where the dog caregivers are going to get their first impressions so we asked you know a number of questions um, around that and the idea was to explore whether if somebody took a very authoritarian approach like I'm telling you, you need to do this with your dog because it's for your good and your dog's good. Uh, whether that encouraged people to follow the plan or whether if a person were to take a more nurturing approach, whether that would encourage the, the person to, to follow the plan. Because, you know, ultimately, whether you're a professional or whether you're um, you know, a dog caregiver, like many of us on this on this call tonight probably are, if you're getting help from someone else, it, it's us, the person who is working with the dog, who is actually the therapist at the end of the day. So whether you go to a trainer or a behaviourist, it's the owner, the caregiver who lives with the dog, who you have to really influence because they're the ones that are going to be with the dog most of the time. It's like a physiotherapist, very wise physiotherapist years ago said to me, Julia, this is 20% me when you come here into into surgery it's 80 percent you you've got to do your exercises otherwise you're not going to get better and i think it's the same with our animals isn't it mm. so um so we asked a series of questions and this is where i mentioned the statements before and we asked people we gave people various statements and said do you know do you strongly agree all the way through do you strong, strongly disagree and you can give those statements put my teeth back in you can give those statements scores which then allows you to do all of the statistical analysis which you can then pull out interesting trends in the data so essentially um four key themes came out of it and the the main one being that the experience that the client and their dog had during that initial consultation was the most important and that that actually did correlate with good behavior modification plan compliance. I used the word compliance in the study because it's well understood in the literature and in the medical <clears throat> medical literature what that means, as in the, the patient um, or the caregiver is actually following the plan that you gave them. I don't like the word because it to me it immediately makes you feel like you have got to do this. 
So I think, you know, adherence is a kinder word, but there are probably others that are, are, are better. But it does say compliance in the papers just, just purely for those historical reasons. So if so if you take an approach or if a client is taken, has an approach taken with them where they are made to feel like they're being listened to and not judged, that kind of thing, we call that client-centered interviewing, that actually correlated with the likelihood of them actually following the plan that they were given, whereas the opposite was true if somebody took an authoritarian approach with them. And, the, and this, is, this is regardless of the type of trainer, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely, totally regardless. This is a very like human to human mm. <laughs> uh, conversation thing. Uh, it's like, yeah, leave, leave your labels at the door. It really, it really doesn't matter. So it's bedside uh, banner, basically. Yeah, effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've all probably been exposed to not great bedside manners in mm. one way or another um, at times. So, yeah, so we had a number of different um, statements. So things, for example, the statements that correlated with people having a poor experience within their consultation and therefore not complying with the plan were things like, um, you know, I felt my answers were being judged by the canine professional i felt the way that i trained my dog was being judged by the professional um the professional might be confrontational um the training methods um suggest oh you've been tapped by a fly training methods suggested might contradict their beliefs and that went both ways actually mm. so it's not yeah that was interesting that went both ways or they didn't believe the plan would work um or the dog became stressed during the training all of that kind of thing Whereas on the on the positive side, that the qualities in the canine professional that correlated with um, adherence to the plan were things like um, trusting that canine professional. And there was a really good study came out of Lincoln a couple of years mm -hmm. before I did mine, uh, Lam et al. Daniel yeah. Mills Group, which is which this work directly followed on from. So they looked in their clinics and they went through all of their um, a number of their cases and pulled out things like trust in the professional was really important, not giving people training techniques that they'd already tried and failed with, which can be challenging, can't it? Because mm, it, you don't know how they've been applied. And so if you feel you have to go back and, and do the same methods, then you have to like really think carefully about how you're gonna bring that up. Um, people felt they could ask questions that they were involved in the development of the behavior modification plan because you know you have to really think about people's time their you know their you know, they whatever might mobility issues they might have other commitments you've got to fit this in around people's lives we can't just ask them to drop everything even as much as you know we might like to so so yeah a whole series of negative statements and a whole series of um positive statements and they fell into two like distinct um groups so the top three positive statements, if you'd like to think of them like that, were um, I, be I believe the plan represented the right approach for my dog, which is great that people are switched on to, um, to that as a concept. The, the canine professional was supportive throughout the consultation and that the client and the canine professional were basically in agreement um, about the, the plan. I know when I started training um, with my very first dog like many many years ago I didn't actually agree with the training plan and I hated what I did with my dog but I didn't know any better it was before I went out and started getting myself educated and you know we invited this professional into our home because he was the professional and he explained what we needed to do with this dog otherwise he was going to dominate us and he was going to do this and he was going to do that and he was a big rottweiler Doberman probably he was a stray but he looked like a do Rottweiler Doberman cross and, and I'm not that those people that know me I'm not actually that big of a person and so we thought oh we've got to do all these things with Lemmy otherwise you know it's all going to go badly wrong and we were so lucky that dog was so so tolerant and so patient of our mistakes and it really chokes me up now to think of the things that we did we didn't use choke chains or pinch collars shock collars or anything like that but there were just things that I wish I'd known better not to do. Um, so the top three 
negative statements, if you like, the sort of authoritarian statements were, I felt the canine profession was judging me personally on the answers I gave to their questions. I felt they were judging me personally on how I trained with my dog and the treatment plan suggested measures that I didn't agree with. Well, at least I had the confidence to speak up and say that, which is more than I did, <laughs> you know, all those, um, all those years ago. And importantly, what, what came out of the study is that those um, participants of the survey, and again, small, small survey numbers, et cetera, but those participants of the survey <coughs> who said that they had a positive experience in this umbrella term that we've called mm -hmm. client-centered interviewing were much more likely to follow the behavior modification plan than if they had had, you know, uh, do this because I'm telling you to do it. Now, massive caveat here, it's the people who are filling in the survey are telling us to what extent they followed the behavior modification plan. So there are so many things when you do a scientific study that you try to control everything as much as you can so that you can draw some useful and valid conclusions. But there are always flaws. There are always things that could be done better. And that's one thing to consider here is it's the, the participants um, telling us whether they uh, went along with it or not so uh, did, did you did you have any correlation or not between for example somebody who'd said that they they loved the trainer the trainer listened and was polite and um they have they felt they had empathy with the trainer but but they didn't agree with the methods did you have any kind of clash like that or that didn't in the analysis that we did mm. those the statements fell into two to two groups i right. guess We'd have to pick out some, you could probably do it. We, we could go back to the data and look, but we didn't at the time. Right, okay. Understood. Yeah, we didn't at the time, but yeah, the, the data is all still there. So um, it could be, yeah, it could be looked at for sure. Um, so, and again, there we found no significant difference between um, the canine professional type, so trainer or behaviourist, were equally likely to use um, this client-centred interviewing approach mm -hmm. or not. And because it was during the pandemic, we also had just asked, like, you know, were you having a remote consultation or a face-to-face? -face? And actually, the vast majority, the majority of responses were face-to-face, -face, and I guess they probably just got them all in before we got properly locked down. But again, no difference in whether people were conducting remote or face-to-face -face consultations that was just like an aside interest really and then we had one question um at the end which we allowed people to have a free text response so it was just a, a blank box um and we basically asked people what what would what would make you not make you, I didn't actually put it like that. What would encourage you to follow a behavior modification plan for your dog in the future? And we got a whole bunch of um, comments and, and questions that came back. So I did something called a thematic analysis where you read through what everybody has written and you try to pull out like high level um, themes and then you drill down and then you, you end up with um, different groups of data if you like and what fell out of this was that um people felt they had um they were more likely to follow a plan in the future if they had a favorable opinion of the canine professional so it's kind of related to the question that you just asked i guess robert but not specifically nope. that the canine professional could demonstrate a good understanding of the problem behavior that the dog was experiencing and have a good plan to resolve it Sharing similar attitudes and beliefs between the professional and the client was also an important feature and having a bespoke and flexible plan. So not just saying, right, here's a six week plan. I give this to every dog that doesn't get on with other dogs or every dog that, you know, doesn't settle when you leave the house or whatever. It, it That just, you know, wouldn't wouldn't cut it. They wanted something that was um, bespoke and tailored to them, but also um, flexible. But some of the some of the comments that, that came out in that free text survey, I'm just going to like read you a few because a, a, a little while ago I was saying about um, 
a, co a correlation between agreeing with the plan and following the plan um, is important, but it doesn't necessarily always go the way that you might you might think. So these were some of the comments. A clear explanation of why the dog does the behavior. Yeah, sounds sensible. Uh, we need supportive, non-judgmental science and evidence-based information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I fully trusted my behaviorist. She was kind and made me feel safe. Ability to fit in around my lifestyle. Clear, easy to follow guidelines. Be there to help me so that, um, you know, when, when I, be there to help me when I'm going wrong. So you think, yeah, great. And then someone said, I wish he'd listened more, which was actually the beginning of the title of the second paper. And that was because the, the, the person that filled it in actually wrote quite a lot. And he'd explained to this person that had been around to, to see them so many times about why this wasn't going to work with their dog. And, and they just they just didn't listen. They just said, no, you just got to do it. Confidence that the behaviorist is a force free reward based trainer. Knowing that I had a balanced trainer and not a positive only fraud trainer. So there were there were lots of different comments that came out, which suggested that there were um, individuals who filled in the survey who would probably from their comments predominantly choose to use reward based training. And there were other people who filled in the survey that would predominantly choose to use to use balanced training. And from a scientific point of view, and from a collecting data for the survey point of view, that was actually really good because my concern about doing um, a Facebook survey is that you know how the Facebook algorithm works. It would be seen by my friends, it would be seen by people in my communities and, and circles and what have you, and therefore it would be a very skewed picture but it did somehow get out into some groups of um, balanced training Facebook groups and it got shared there. So I was very fortunate because it meant that I got a more, uh, I don't want to say balanced, another word for it, <laughs> I got a broader, I, I got a broader population of people responding than I perhaps otherwise would have done. So, um, so that was really good. Um, that's, you know, kind of in a nutshell what those two papers covered like I said it's worth bearing in mind it was a social media shared survey so that would have automatically excluded lots of people from filling it in people that fill in surveys are self-selecting in, in that you know they genuinely enjoy filling in surveys or they've got something that they want to say so we will have missed the opinions and comments for so many other people that didn't see it or chose not to not to fill it in I mentioned some of the limitations about, you know, defining what a canine professional mm -hmm. is in terms of trainer behaviorist, the <clears throat> method, et cetera. Um, but I think, I think on balance, it, it gave us, you know, quite a good insight into who's doing what in the UK in terms of which professionals are offering which services. And that, you know, essentially it's not rocket science, but if you're nice, isn't the word, if you if you're empathetic and understanding and not be judgmental whatever the person says to you i think you're much more likely to get them on side which you know is, especially in this group that's you know it's obvious to all of us i'm sure and also as a, as a caregiver as well i i would have really appreciated a lot more empathy when i was looking for help with my uh, with lemmy in the beginning than than i got and you know it's just one of those things but um yeah so essentially that's that's the the research as it is to date um we're hoping to have um uh an nsc student at edinburgh uh carry on i don't know which direction they want to take it yet but to carry on some of this research um at the end of the year so we'll see where that goes yeah brilliant yeah i think one one of the really interesting things that came out for me on this one is the fact that um it was 85 percent women who filled in the survey 15 percent men yeah and i i kind of thought when i read that well that's quite typical and that but then strangely i the conversation i had with lorna winter and her zip zap her, her zigzag puppy app um i must must have been out three or four weeks ago now the 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 um split basically is about 50 50 of the people contacting her mm -hmm. and wanting help from their puppies so you're you're much more likely to be a man rolling around in the floor making funny noises with your puppy 
as you are with a woman. And I think what's really interesting is is why the difference. Yes, yeah, and it's and it's been found in other studies as well. In, in terms of there was an Australian study looking at you know participants in dog training classes, and again, it, it was predominantly females who turned up to to take the dog to to classes. So, yeah, who knows why? Exactly. It, yeah, and I think I think the split was fairly similar uh, in one of the tables. You showed the split with the canine professionals was basically. Um, well, they're almost neck and neck, 98, yes. yeah, yeah. 98 men right. and 137 females. Yes, yes, which which I actually found surprising given mm. given the balance when you go to workshops. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where are all these people hiding? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, well, no, well it's, so, it's such a female-dominated industry. Yes, it's it a appears bit, to it, be. It, it appears to be. Maybe we're just the noisy ones that people know about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like there's a veterinary profession is now. One thing that really interests me and I think would be interesting for the audience is perhaps just unpicking a little bit your client centered interviewing that you you had the pyramid there in figure four. Yes. Um, yes. Could you so, perhaps break down and speak us through a little bit the, the, what, what each level actually means in here? Yes. So it occurred to me that you know everybody likes a graphic. Mm. <laughs> it's easier to it's easier to explain, perhaps. So. So I put together this like this pyramid and at the bottom is, is client centered interviewing. And then above that, there are the different layers at the top of the apex. It's um, client adherence to that plan. And I just tried to pull out the key features that were that came out of the statistics as being um, as being important. So a bedrock there definitely is to build um, build an empathic relationship with the client regardless of what they say to you regardless of what they're doing you think like it might be that you, you go and you think oh crikey and I wish I wish you weren't doing that but we, we can't say that because that you're you know immediately going to potentially get that person's back up but at the same time um it may be that some things do need to be changed but we have to make sure that we don't inappropriately challenge those things that we do it in as much as we can in, in a constructive way have you thought about trying this no I've done that before shall we try it together or you know just finding you know nice encouraging ways to try to um yeah just to get people to to give it another go because sometimes people will try stuff and don't quite try it in the right way or try it for 10 minutes and then it doesn't work and you're not quite sure what they've done so so yeah so in avoiding inappropriate challenge because I think no, nobody likes to be told they're wrong to their face do they none of us are really good at that no. being able to clearly explain the behavior problem so really thinking about all the different factors that could be influencing that behavior whether they are health issues working through the vet whether there are different emotional states whether there's a, what the learning history there the type of the dog that it is what kind of um, genetic tendencies they might have you know etc 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 so um so at cope when i did my um diplomas that um that robert mentioned at the beginning that was just the best grounding ever because it literally covers all of those bases and it, it's just like it was just the most amazing education period of time for me um, I mean, doing the MSc was fantastic, but I always come back to my cope learning. That's the bedrock of everything. Oh, bless you. And that's and that's where this clearly explained the behavior problems is because, you know, if you can't get your own head around it, how are you going to explain it to someone else? But some clients want loads of detail and some don't. But you've just got to try to get it out there really succinctly. And then on the top of that, then we need to create a really specific plan to not just the problem, but to that dog in that family, in that environment, in their situation, in their lifestyle, which is going to be very different to someone else who might seemingly have the same, the same problem. And clients really appreciate it if they feel that um, they are being treated as individuals. So, so the lesson here, I think, is, is for the behaviourists that use these um, forms where you just fill out the form. You have this bespoke, the bespoke template and you just copy paste the, the name of the animal into this form and give them this great big 60 page document yeah the impression that we got and the comments in the free text box mm. would caution against that i mean it may be in some situations it might it might work but you think there are so many variables involved in 
in our lives and on the lives of our animals that I just can't imagine how that would work. And in fact, from my own experience, being given that kind of a plan with Lemmy in the beginning, it's like, well, actually, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't no. work. <laughs> but the response was like, well, you're not doing it right or you're not doing it hard enough or you're not. It's like, oh, my God. Um, so, so yeah, having a, having a plan that's very specific to that situation and that dog. And then following it up. So, you know, not just flying in, saying this is what you do and then flying out. And I think that I don't think that many people do that anymore. At least I hope not. Um, we had um, a behaviorist come and visit us for a different dog, actually. Um, and she came in for two hours. Um, we went for a walk, didn't see another dog. And that was it. Mm. And, and it was like, oh, right. Oh, well, that was X many hundreds of pounds well spent. There was no follow up at all. So um, and that that was a very common factor that that kept coming up. So so all of those things together, the sort of, you know, empathy, understanding the problem, not judging the client, regardless of what they say or do, clearly explaining the problem and then coming up with a great plan that's hopefully going to help. And it's not like you've got to fix everything at that first session because you know, you're not you're not going to be able to. I've got a client at the moment, she's coming towards the end of her 12 week plan. And she knows she's going to have to book more time. I've tried to pack as much as I can, but her dog has got so many different um, things that need help with that it's going to take a bit longer. And so I think sometimes as well, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, don't we? And think like, well, we've got to fix this in X amount of time because we think that often clients think that as well. So managing people's expectations, I think, is really important. But all of these things together, hopefully, will encourage people to stick to the plan because if they can stick to the plan then together we're more likely to make progress and when I say stick to the plan I don't mean here's the plan go away and that's going to be fine because it's going to need tweaking you, you know responding to what happens and how the dog responds is really important um, as well. One thing you said Julie is that um, it's actually not all rosy uh, as far as the clients are concerned, they don't find the behaviorists and everything's magic. Um, you said that around half the people actually went to more than one. So can you, can you unpack that a little bit? Yes. So we just simply asked the question, like, how many canine professionals did you um, did you consult? And quite a few people had been to more than one. But some people have been to quite, it seems to be gone to quite a few. And that would potentially... I think there's different ways you can interpret mm -hmm. that. It could be that um, they just didn't find the help that they needed and therefore had to go through multiple people until they found an approach that suited them. There's also the potential that for some people, their expectations perhaps haven't been managed that well and they're looking for quite a quick fix and then they don't get it so they go to the next person and then the next person and the next person and I think it's really important that we can try our best to explain to people why it takes a long time to change your behavior especially if it's something that's been long-standing and then to avoid the temptation to reach for something that might feel like it could be a quick fix which ultimately in the end could make the problem worse depending on the temperament of that dog the disposition of the dog the relationship between the person you know and all that kind of thing so yeah it, it is it is really interesting and it does suggest that you know like all of us can improve for sure um because clients are not necessarily finding the right person um at the right you know the first time that they first time that they try hey did did you have any kind of correlations come through of suggesting that the dogs with more aggression um, were presented or were presenting um, or related to the, the behavior technique being used? We didn't do that correlation. Again, we could. Um, so the, the, there's a few different questions when I've been mm -hmm. talking about this, people have asked and like I said, like the data is there. And it would be interesting to look, but you know, to be honest, from from my thesis point of view, I would have been like way over way over my word count and had to and had to limit it. 
And I actually did get criticised um, for the way that I wrote my thesis because the whole thing about who's doing what in the UK and what methods and stuff they were using, I put that in because I was really interested and there was and my whoever marked it said, but this isn't really addressing your hypothesis about client-centred <laughs> interviewing, is it? And I was like, yeah, I know that. But I mean, you know, I thought, yeah, but I just want to know because if it's useful information, then we'll publish it and get it out there. So um yeah, it's yeah, it, that there are there are a lot. I think there's still a lot of data in there that could be pulled out. If I could face going back doing all the stats again. <laughs> <laughs> and just talk a little bit about the publishing process for you, Julie. Um, you submit papers, they're peer reviewed. Um, what kinds of things very generally did you um, have the paper rejected for initially? So with the first paper, so the first paper about, you know, who, who's doing yep. what, trainers' behaviours, blah, blah, blah. That was actually the fastest paper I've had accepted ever uh, and my co-authors ever. Literally, I got the manuscript through and there were such tiny, tiny things to, to change yes. that on the same afternoon, Karen Overall emailed back and said, yeah, it's been accepted, it's going through. And I was like, crikey, wow. <laughs> the second paper um took longer and I think that went through four rounds of revision and as a result came out a lot stronger so the the reviewer the reviewers that um went through it for me came yes. back with comments about you know well can you can you really say this can you be more specific about this and actually one of the things that was really important that they pulled out from this work, which hadn't crossed my mind, but it was obvious when they said it, is that regardless, you know, so, so, so what they said was basically, you're saying, I'm saying, we're saying that taking a client-centered interviewing approach is a good thing and that we should all aspire to do that, mm. to encourage people to, to do what we ask them to do. And I was like, well, yeah. And they said, well, what about, um, what about this tool in the hands of someone that's promoting training methods that we may not approve of? And I was like, well, actually, yeah, that's a good point. So um, so we just put in a few sentences um, in the discussion about that because it is a good point. And the reviewer wanted me to um, or was encouraging me to include comments about um, a particular well-known TV trainer and I chose not to do that because it's a scientific paper and I didn't feel it was appropriate so I pushed back on that and they agreed to that but it like I said it went through I think three or four um, rounds of revision and as a result has come out as a, as a stronger piece of work and this is normal in science the first mm -hmm. one that went through really easily um, it's not, not, but to be honest, I mean, what you're going to argue out of a graph over how many people do this and how many people do that, whereas this, there are interpretations of what people have said and impressions and checking the stats, and, you know, it's all sorts of all sorts of things happen in that peer review process. It's not perfect. Um, you do get biased. So there's a joke in science about the third reviewer. So typically <laughs> you get you'll get like two reviews will come back and you'll go oh yeah phew that that's okay this is all right then the third review will come through and kill it um but when you get over that kind of like <gasps> I can still remember reading the first reviews to the first paper I ever tried to get published and I was absolutely devastated but it's just part of the scientific process and it's there to make sure that things that are published are as rigorous as they can be and that the data has been looked at from different angles so that when it's written up it has as least bias as from the from the person that's written it as, as possible so as I said it's not perfect peer review is usually anonymous um so people can say what they like which is a good thing in some ways um in other ways people feel like if the reviewer had to put their name to it they may be less vindictive but I think I think science no, no I don't think science needs rigor it needs proper investigation it needs challenge and you know whatever is published and you read it always be questioning it <clears throat> excuse me always be questioning it and, and Robert is an excellent tutor on this if you've you know if you looked at his website or listened into his um webinars and things about you know don't just take things at face value really 
read it properly, check it. If you don't understand it, talk to a colleague about it, talk to someone else about it, write to the authors. You know, sometimes they do actually respond if you um, if you ask them something, because most scientists like to talk about their work, as you might have realised this evening. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, very strong proponent of science. So in the first paper, you talked about pain quite a lot, the importance of having the pain as a factor. I know it's not something you studied. Okay. No. Uh, or you could you could really um, extrapolate from the data. Mm -hmm. But did you get anything in the kind of free script or anything like that of, of uh, clients mentioning that their dog might be in pain or that there might be a link somewhere? No, we didn't. And I think that's possibly because we chose to exclude mm -hmm. dogs that. So this is like a double edged sword. So we choose we chose to exclude dogs that were on any kind of um medication including behavioral psychopharmacology because it has been shown that if dogs are on that kind of medication it can influence whether or not the client then follows the plan so when we were designing the study we chose to remove those uh, not include those not invite those people to participate so that's a whole bunch of opinions that we've lost there and also we that may have also meant that people whose dogs may I don't know, may have arthritis or kidney disease or something else may have thought, well, I, I can't feel that in either. So we wanted to try to make it as clean as possible with respect to understanding that initial consultation process. Um, and this is why, you know, there are always caveats. <laughs> there are always caveats in a study design. But for sure, um, pain, as, as we know from, from the Mills paper, and and other you know just just general experience in the industry has such a profound influence on behavior and not just like the behavior itself but but the animal's capacity to respond to a behavior modification plan whether you, you know if you're asking the dog cat budgie whatever to do something that they're not physically or emotionally capable of because they're unwell then that's unfair and then that would also potentially by the client then be reported as well, it failed. It well, it didn't really fail, did it? It was it was never it wasn't the appropriate time to do it, which is why. It's it is so important that taking on any kind of behavioral workers on veterinary referrals so that we can make sure that the animal is fit and healthy before we start. And I know it's it's you know, it doesn't necessarily screen out everything at the beginning. So as behaviorists, we spend a lot more time with that animal and that then their vet might have in that you know initial consult 10, 10 minute consultation or whatever but then but that door is then open you're working together as a team so if you see something a bit unusual you think like Man, is that dog walking a bit oddly is that my imagination or could you just film that and send it to the vet and see what they think then you know that the conversation is already is already open and i think that's a, a really vital part of the process one thing that actually came out of one of the tables that you had one working dog Yes, I know, just one. <laughs> I know. We discussed that. We discussed whether we should leave that one out. And I said, no, I don't leave anybody out. So, so yeah, I mean, that that result is, you know, neither here nor there, really. It was just one. <laughs> one word. No, it just sort of sticks out like a bit of a sore thumb. On this. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I was expecting we might have a bit more of a, a spread than that. But I guess it's just who the survey reached. Yeah, the exactly. Data. Can you remember or did you actually gather any information as to what that dog's problems were? Yes, I would, again, I would, I would have it, but I didn't. Yeah, okay. I've got a massive spreadsheet, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I could check it out for you, but yeah, I haven't got it to my, I haven't got it to my fingertips right now. Well, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of full of gems, but I, I think one of the other huge benefits of both your pizzas of work is that they've got so many references in them, really, really useful practical references, uh, which I think are really well worth following up for the people listening. Uh, a lot of those are open access. Um, the ones add, you know, on pain that we've already discussed, the Lohi paper, um, that huge survey from um, Finland. There's the other paper which came out of the Mills factory, uh, which was the, the kind of the compliance scale. I forgot what that was called. Um, mm -hmm. But the one that your second paper was based on, there's lots of really useful information in there. Mm -hmm. So I think for anyone who's building up a behavior business, for anyone who wants to improve the way they actually do their work, there's a wealth of information there that you can tap into, as well as Julie's papers here. Um, so I think the message is that for those of us who are working in canine behavior, 
Um, there's a lot we can learn here to improve the way we do things, to make it more structured, um, to make it more evidence-based, which it, which it will be if we base it on, on your wonderful pyramid. And for the clients who are watching, um, that second paper, I think, is an absolute gem because I think that would be music to their ears. And it's the kind of thing they could hold up and go and show their behaviorists and say, you know, are you one of these empathic behaviorists? <laughs> are you following the rules? Here's the triangle you need to make. <laughs> so I think that's that's about it, Julie. I think we've kind of used up our hour. I don't know if there's anything else you want to slip in at the, at the end. I, yeah, I don't think so. No, no, I, I think that's fantastic. You know, I've certainly learned a lot more about these two papers. So thank you ever so much for all your time and onwards and upwards. And we will all be watching you closely to see where you go once you leave your, your uh, professorship behind at University College and move into the dog world full time. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Robert. And, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks a lot. Bye now. Bye. Bye.